The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant so Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we're coming to you live from the Warner Center in Woodland Hills, California. This is the new home for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. It's the new home for Autism Live. I have to give you a little programming note as we start. As many of you had written into us on last Thursday's show, we have been having some technical difficulties. I want to let you know that we're narrowing it down. We think it's a short and one particular wire. We, we might have it, we might not, but I, I want everybody to know what a great job Matt has been doing. He has just been working himself to the bone uh, to try to correct these problems, and even this morning uh, has been in here very early so that we could bring you today's show. So hopefully uh, we'll be okay for today's show, but you're going to forgive us if we have any hiccups because we've got great guests for you today. In fact, we're starting out the show with Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grampiche is here with us in the studio live. We're thrilled to have her with us this morning, and she's going to be answering your questions in real time. In our second hour, today during Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. It will still be only me, although Nancy will be back in a couple of weeks. Our special guest today, Paul Fagel from Awake Labs, is going to be talking to us about the new Reveal. It is a wristband that helps to measure physiologic, physiological excuse me, uh, changes in a child as they happen in real time so that you can track and begin to predict, predict when meltdowns might be coming and when you can prevent them. It's a really cool um, thing that's out in Indiegogo and you can be a part of making it come to market. And then a little bit later in that hour, we are scheduled to have Vince Redmond, a licensed marriage and family therapist with us to talk about what are the benefits of having a licensed marriage and family therapist working with you when you're on this journey through autism, all the different things that they can do to help and support a family as, because it's a great thing, trust me. Uh, all that's coming up in just a few minutes. We want to remind you that the entire show is meant to be interactive, and Matt is going to show you some of the different ways that you can interact with us while I remind you our homepage is autism-live.com. When you go there, lots of things to do. There is a new blog up there, and there will be a new blog up as well tomorrow. So definitely check out the blog. Uh, but you can participate in the live feature. If you go to the home screen, you can click on the triangle that's on the screen to be watching the live show or the most recently recorded live show, or you can put your cursor in the box that's to the side that says your question. We call that the live feature. All you have to do is type and hit enter. There's no login, there's no username, there's no cost, it's completely anonymous. Uh, hit send and it shows up here on my screen so that way you and I can be talking but ever so much more important you can be talking to our experts in real time. Now I do want to say before we go to Ask Dr. Doreen I have these amazing toys sitting on my desk again still. We featured Lux Blocks, this is what these are on the show on Thursday but it was when we were having prime sound issues. So, so many of you wrote it and said, what is that cool thing? We see Jem playing with it. We see you talking to somebody about it, but we want to know more about it. We are arranging with Lexbox to come back and be with us, but we love that so many of you thought it was a really cool toy. It's a building toy. You can put it together and then it has movement. It's an amazing, we've had so much fun with this all week long. I can't even tell you uh, how much fun and how many people have enjoyed playing with it and said, boy, it's like a stress reliever. And the myriads of different ways that you can put it together. So again, these are called Lux Blocks. You can go to luxlux.com to check them out. They have a YouTube page that has just videos of people putting these together in different ways. This was something that my son 
put together while he was on camera the other day, and we have, it's been like the the challenge. To, we're we're going to give this Dr. Grampy Shea in a few minutes and have her see what she makes with it. We've made so many different shapes with this thing. Uh, it's been a good time. So Lux Blocks, and we will have them back on the show, and we have a couple of these to give away. We're going to be letting you know more about them. But first, my friends, it is time for Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. We're here with Dr. Doreen Grampiche, and she's live with us in the studio. Good morning. Good morning. Questions. Good morning. So thrilled to have you here. We're thank just, you very much. You always elevate what we do. It's, it's such a pleasure to have you oh, here. Oh, thank you so much, Shannon. And such a pleasure it's my because pleasure. Our, our viewers tune into this hour more than any other hour so that they can have an opportunity to talk to you through this format. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time, want to let you know that Dr. Grampiche is, uh, I believe, the preeminent expert in autism in our time. Time. Thank you so uh, much. any time, really, what other time is there but this mm -hmm. for autism, right? She's been working in this field for more than 30 years. I always want to mm -hmm. slur that because <laughs> look it. And uh, has worked with individuals from birth through senior citizens to help them to get to the progress that they want to see. Um, she's not only an expert in the field of autism, she's a visionary in this field, helps all of us to recognize what the next turn, what the next bend in the road is, because it's full of bends in the road, especially right. in the last five years. Absolutely, yes. So she's here, and she answers your questions in real time. We do like to remind everybody that there is no expert that in this format can give individual specific advice. So what does that mean? It means you can write in a question, and Dr. Crampuchet can't tell you, well, this is what you need to do for this individual, but she can give us information about the things that we're asking about that help us to ask the next best question and I find that in life it's all about are you asking the right question it's so true yeah that's so right. and and also we get to take a tour of your brain to hear the thoughts that you have on these things which is so illuminating thank you and um, I have a lot of thoughts about these things so well, it's and, always fun to share and you uh, I got to hear you speak a little bit this morning about some of the places that you've been and some of the mm -hmm. things that you've been doing. And right, last week this time I was doing a keynote presentation for the state of Texas. They have an organization called DARS that provides matched funding for families, which is really nice, and they funded us for the last several years. And they are the reason that we've opened in Houston and Corpus Christi, San Antonio, several areas. So I did their keynote and it was about diagnosis of autism and how that uh, reflects on how much ABA you should do. Mm. Sort of like the more severe you are, the, your symptoms are obviously the more you should do ABA and the focus areas and it was fun. It was actually very nice because I haven't, I've stopped traveling a lot for conferences. I don't know if you know for years I did that and now I'm focused more on the new card sites. but. Uh, I, uh, when I was putting the talk together, and it was like the night before, <laughs> I was like, okay, I should throw in some video because I think it's important for people to also understand how far, you know, the, what I like about the diagnosis, Shannon, I'm going off topic, but it, I yes. noticed that our first question is about diagnosis, yeah. our first and second question. So, but when I was looking at the diagnostic criteria and how it's changed over the years, and now that we have these sort of ASD, which is the whole spectrum, and there, there's a huge difference between a, a, the high end of the spectrum and the low end, or the two ends of the spectrum. Uh, one way of looking at it is that to, it makes it possible now for people to realize that you can go from the most severe end to the highest end. And so as I was doing that, I started thinking, well, you know what, I should throw in some videos of kids who showed the most severe type of behavior. And it was fantastic because I didn't have all my video with me. I had access to what was on my laptop. And I had uh, happened to have uh, two of our kids' videos of when they were very young. One of the kids is, of course, on the recovered film, Ruffin, and who's running around, running back and forth doing self cemetery type running, you know, very, that's kind of like the raw, most severe type of self-stimulatory behavior or the restricted repetitive behavior is just running back and forth, hand flapping and saying, ee, you know, and that is like 
the core of autism. And then I had Ruffin's video now as he's doing a lecture in Berlin on robotics. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, right. I could use. And then I had the same experience with Logan's video right. who's, that's out there as well. And I had two year video of him doing this and then video of him talking about be, becoming a drummer and all this sort of stuff. And it was awesome that I could use those guys and do their pre-post as well as show sort of the range of, of this diagnostic uh, syndrome. It's pretty amazing. That is amazing. And I think that that's reason for hope for everyone. Absolutely. I, I mean, and that's what it's all about. It's like you have to believe that when you do these interventions, you have to put it all in. Yeah. You cannot go into a behavioral intervention without, I mean, I think it's, a, it's more of a waste of time if you're not 100% committed because it's not an easy thing. It's not something that's going to happen in a, a week or, you know, a month. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of commitment. It's a lot of hours. It's, and it's a lot of energy from the parents. It's a big project, let's put it that way. Um, but if you do it and if you focus for three years on everything your child, you have a lot of great options. You have a lot of avail opportunities open up for your child. Do you remember they used to have that little life's little instruction booklet that was yeah. big yeah. in like yeah. the 90s? Um, there was yeah, one totally. page in it that w became a, a mantra for first a group of friends and then my family that says, when going after Moby Dick, pack the tartar sauce. Exactly. Right? And so there, That's was, so great. There, was a, there was a project that I was doing with a bunch of friends and it had hit the skids and somebody read that and I went, forget it, I'm going to the grocery store and I'm getting a, a, a thing of tartar sauce That's and I'm right. putting it on the ledge here and we're all going to look at that and know we've packed the tartar sauce. And when we were just starting therapy with CARD, I went and got a thing of tartar sauce. That's and right. I put it on the ledge in the kitchen and I said, this is the tartar sauce, we're going to do this all exactly. in. Exactly. And Matt, I just want to let you know that later on today I'm going to get the tartar sauce for our sound <laughs> problem. Um, but it's when you make that decision of I'm going to do everything... Everything. Whatever it is, Whatever right, it is. right. And then I have to be honest. That's when you let go of the expectation of what the final thing is. And that's so right. often we look as autism parents about, well, will my kid get there? Will my kid get there? Well, it really isn't about that. When you really pack the tartar sauce, you go, we're we're in this. We're yes, in this. doesn't yes. matter what the end result is. We're in this, and we're going to get as far as we can. Uh, exactly, and that that what you just said at the very end. That as far as we can is there. It's like when we say, will my kid get there? Yeah. The key is to realize that by being all in, your kid, your child will get as far as he or she can. Yeah. And they, and it, you are contributing to their ongoing life. Just like when they're little, I mean, sometimes parents, we as parents all go crazy and just force our kids to do a billion things. But the point is like, why is it more important to us? Like why does a parent make sure that their child knows athletics or knows piano or whatever it is, but we don't take the time and the, we don't invest as much in our ABA programs. You know, we really need to, all of our parents, if there are any card parents listening, this is my biggest lesson is really put everything in, just go for it and do the best you can because it really does make a big difference. It's and it's worth it. I Absolutely. Could, I could lay down and cry for an hour about just that, but it is worth it. Absolutely. I, I live that every single day. Right. There is never a day where I think, oh, wish we hadn't done therapy. Yeah. There are days when I think, wow, I wish we'd, we'd done this harder, this better. And then I say to myself, don't second guess. We, you know, we did what we, what right. we could. Right. But um, you will never regret never. the time I agree. that you put in. At, the, at whatever moment you're at. Absolutely. You never regret the time. All right. Well, that was a lovely talk, but we have people who are waiting and want yes, questions. Yes, let's do okay. it. So uh, somebody wrote in. They said, hi, my name is, I'm not going to bother saying that, uh, not that we have the last name, but my daughter is seven and was diagnosed with level five high-functioning autism. Uh, what I can't explain to people is, 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 is she full-blown autistic or mild? So I have never heard level five autism. Okay. I, I, I don't know I what that is. Know. No, I, I don't know what that know. is. I know that's an error because I diagnose kids and that is not a thing. There are three levels. 
Um, the, and the levels have to do with the amount of help the individual needs. And the levels pertain to two areas. So the first area that the levels pertain to are social communication, and the second area is the restricted repetitive behaviors. Do you think they added the numbers to get to a five? It's possible. Maybe somebody made that mistake. It's possible. So when you diagnose, and this was kind of one of the funny things when I was giving the diagnostic lecture, but when you diagnose, you basically will say uh, autism spectrum disorder and then level, it, you don't even mention the levels. You just say, so level one means they require support in the area of social communication or requires support in the area of restricted repetitive behaviors. Level two is they require, I think, some support. Okay. And level three is they require significant support. Okay. So the diagnostic is actually written that way. It'll say, uh, this individual has autism spectrum disorder requiring some support in the area of social communication and significant support in the area of restricted repetitive behaviors. That in numbers would mean that there are two in the area of social communication and there are three. So the, more, the higher the number, the more serious, the more severe but you don't even mention the numbers in the diagnosis itself. You specifically just say requiring support, requiring some support, or requiring significant support in each of those areas. So this level five, I have no idea what that means. It must be a mistake. High-functioning autism, generally speaking, we talk about high-functioning autism when there's a certain amount of communication. Like in my mind, what a high-functioning individual would be is that there's communication is there, there's some basic speech, and language, we're still missing, like let's say, advanced pragmatic language. Um, and there's not a whole lot of the restricted repetitive behaviors. That would be someone high functioning as someone who's like a one-one, like basically they don't need a whole lot of support. Right. Um, and what you can explain to people is that it is sort of the, the higher end of the spectrum in the commonality with people who are very high functioning and uh, just being on the spectrum, the reason they're on the spectrum is because they still have problem with social behavior. Uh, so they, these would be things like they don't really understand when they're enter, like to, standing too close to someone or talking about their own subject all the time or they don't know how to uh, you know, in, enter a conversation and not dominate it. They don't know how to t take someone else's perspective and understand how other people feel. Those are the areas that are most affected when you have a high functioning individual. I wonder, you know, so much of, I think in the beginning of autism, what I hear from parents and what I certainly experienced is that we want to know where our kids are sure. in the realm of things. I've talked before about the fact that skills gives the best snapshot of I think so I've too. Across. Right. And if you really want to know and understand where your kiddo is, taking the, that assessment in skills, and, and it's probably a two to three week commitment of time on yes. a regular basis, not eight hours a day, but you know, you do a certain amount of it, and then you kind of get a belly full of it and have to walk away from it for a while and come back. Um, but I think of it as an investment in ourselves, our family, and our kids right. um, that's so helpful and useful. And then at the end, you get a visual printout that shows a bunch of different skills, like every important skill, and it shows where your child is at this point in time, what the norm is for their age. Right. And then as, you, as your child learns things, it shows what your child has gained and how much closer it's getting. It's the best thing right but that would tell you where your child is because i feel like this we all want to know so what level i think parents are asking so what level we i know the numbers is he a one is he a two in my day we, we used i one of the first questions i asked when i was told autism in conjunction with my son was well is it asperger's you know? right right because you're hoping for you know how what, right what, tell me how capable is he going to be so I think that that's the best thing to do if you're a parent and you want to know. I think I agree. And there's that whole thing of explaining it to other people. Everything right. from your mother-in-law to the kindergarten teacher to the person who you're in line with at the bank who's watching your child melt down who goes, why is your child misbehaving? It's knowing what you to can say, to, say others. Yeah. to others. Right. And I don't know what, I'd love to hear your advice on this. I think it's so personal. It's very personal, yeah. 
I, I, I think, you know, and it's, it's, you're giving me a different perspective, obviously, uh, because I haven't lived through that process of like explaining to people what it actually means because uh, you have your child with you and they're wondering why they're behaving a certain way, for instance. I think it's a matter of, I, what I always tell parents is, I'm, let's, don't worry about the diagnostic label. Let's not focus on that. Although I have to say, I'm one of the first people, if you remember when DSM-5 came out and people hated it, I liked it. Yes. I was like, I actually like this because it's the first time it gives us severity levels. It's yeah. the first time it describes it much better than it did before. Yeah. DSM-4 was very like, this or this, you know, it was very like, it, it almost made it feel like it's a different thing if you have PDD, NOS versus autism. Right. And it's not, it's a, it's a continual spectrum. But it, so I think the more important thing, instead of like using labels like Asperger's or ASD or severity levels, is just to describe the issues the person has. The, the only value of having a diagnosis is, is two things to me. One is when you have a diagnosis, you automatically um, are referred to the right type of treatment. You know, I wouldn't be able to give you an antibiotic if I didn't know that you have a bacterial infection. So the diagnosis helps with determining, hey, you got autism, okay, ABA, you know, versus something else. So that is a good thing about the diagnosis. And the second thing with the diagnosis, obviously, is that you get funding, right, with the diagnosis. That's it, that's the only value. The rest is just about looking at your child's deficit areas and building them. That's all it is. And if your child has challenging behavior, always remember that's a side effect. That's not part of the symptoms. It's a side effect of not being able to communicate their issues at any level. And I'm not just talking about autism. I'm talking about teenagers who have meltdowns and challenging behavior. It's because they're not getting their point across and the society or environment around them is not reinforcing for them. And if you can change that, if you can set up a system for your child at whatever level where they can express themselves however and they can uh, receive a fair amount of reinforcement, then they won't have challenging behavior. It's really that simple. Yeah. So that's it. With autism, I think it's really important for all of us just to like, you know, if someone, if a child's having a tantrum, it's important to be able to tell other people it's because he thinks that's the way to communicate something he's not happy about. He's not able to communicate it differently. You know, that's, Absolutely. I think, the biggest point. And as I'm thinking about it, what the words that we use, of course, has changed over the years with our son um, because our kids change. Right. And the world changes. Right. And our perceptions of things change. So, you know, I think finding the set thing to say maybe isn't the thing to do, but but... I think what's been successful for us over the years is when we have said, here's what we're working on. Right. And not even said the diagnosis. I don't say the diagnosis anymore to very many people, but we'll say, oh, we're working on this. Yeah. Then we can be in the hallway, and right. he's just spatially, I'll say, oh, you know, we're working on personal space as he walks right. by and cuts somebody right. off. And right. we'll go, oh, we're working on that. Right, like, right, like exactly, absolutely. Um, but, absolutely. But it's personal. It's personal. And oh, it's, it's personal very and personal. To our kids and individual to us. And Absolutely. And I find, I find more and more I have to morph what I say out of respect for my son. I, no doubt, him. no doubt. But you know, Shannon, it's a much more uh, accepting world. Yes. I mean, goodness. it is such an accepting world now. Yes, thank goodness. Absolutely. I mean, I remember, I don't know what was ha happening. I don't remember now. Something in the last couple of weeks took me back to... The, the 70s when I entered this world. I don't remember what it was. Something happened and we started talking. I think it was, I had a meeting with some people at Columbia and we were talking about the history. And I was just, I was just thinking to myself, my God, things have changed. Like, you know, I mean, I actually went through a phase in the late 70s where parents were afraid when they came to you. It was almost like the first hour they were trying to convince us that they were not uh, cold parents because that was, yeah. yeah, that was the the whole thing back then. And it was like, it was an offshoot, you know, we, we always say it was Bettelheim alone, but it wasn't, it was an offshoot of this whole thing called schizophrenogenic mother, which was like in the old days, people thought schizophrenia develops from that as well. And then of course, Bettelheim came and said, it's got to have something, autism also has something to do with the cold mother or the refrigerator mother. 
And if you, I mean, can you believe that's where we started? Like, yeah. it's crazy, you know, and we've yeah. come a far way with understanding autism. Not far enough, we right. still don't know what causes it in most cases and so on, but nevertheless, because the prevalence is so high, we have now become much more accepting. Mm -hmm. uh, people just don't, uh, in general, I think the U.S. over the past decade has become very accepting of, of choices and of of just differences, yeah. differences. I think that's amazing, you we're, know. We're all learning and growing. Absolutely, and absolutely. Us, and that's important. I want to take a short break and then I want to come back and get another question. Um, so stick with us. We're going to be back with more Ask Dr. Doreen after these messages. Here with Dr. Doreen Grampuche. It's just my favorite time of the week. We get to, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but we get to like take some of your energy, and I know you oh. need it for all the things <laughs> that you're doing, but it's just a fabulous thing to be able to hear your mind and, and, and to Thank know you. that there are people like you are working on helping our kids. It's just everything. Thank you so just much. Everything. Thank you. So Dr. Grampuche is answering your questions in real time. You can still be writing them in on autism-live.com. Uh, somebody wrote in and said, I have a boy of five years old. He's diagnosed with autism. autism. He's verbal. His main problem is that his concentration is very poor. It uh, takes too much time for him to finish any word. So how can we increase his concentration? Right. So that's a, there's a lot in that question. I'm going to try to divide it first. What I would do in this case w would be to assess a little bit more and find out is his concentration poor across the board? Is it poor in certain tasks? That's really important because if it's across the board, no matter what the task is, then I know there's something going on with his mind and his ability to focus on anything. 
And then I, that would lead me to a certain number of exercises that have to do with focusing on different things, if it, which I'll talk about in a minute. But if it's about specific things, like words perhaps, or just visual things, or just auditory things, or just, uh, let's say, letter-related or number-related, then I know that it has something to do with that particular stimulus, and then I would work on uh, things differently. Let me just give some examples. So if it's, let's say, about writing, writing things, then it could also be a fine motor issue with the child and being able to write, you know, or hold a pen. It could also be a, a hand-eye coordination type issue. It could also be a visual issue on itself. So it's, then it, I have to find out what it is that he's having a problem with and then work on that specific thing. Um, so let's assume that it is across the board, I don't know, and then we're trying to help the child with uh, mental activities, I guess, that would help him concentrate better. There's a lot of different things you could do. You would take a baseline of the amount of time that he is able to focus, just so you figure out exactly how long is he able to focus and when does he lose his focus. Um, at which point I would j gradually shape that. So like, let's say he can focus for 10 seconds and, I, and you reward him at 10 seconds and then he, you gradually will have him focus on something for 15 seconds and then you reward that, 20 seconds and you reward that and so on. Another aspect of, so that's shaping up his focus. Another aspect of this whole thing is to consider is does he have a comorbid diagnosis of ADHD? I mean, not being able to focus has a lot, sometimes it's just a biochemical thing with our kids where they actually would benefit from a stimulant and that would allow them to focus a little bit better. So I'd want to assess that. Another thing is what are the environmental things that are distracting him? Uh, is he better focused if he's under certain environmental conditions like Let's say a lot of my kids focus poorly if they're sitting in the back of the class and there's windows around them or there's a different sound that they can hear that we can't hear, like this type of light has sound. You and I can focus no problem because we can't even hear this, but our kids get distracted because that sound is actually pretty loud for them. Or if they're sitting near light, they might be uh, distracted to look at the light. There's a ton of things, so you have to kind of, basically what I'm saying is you need much more assessment of the situation before you can pick the right treatment. You have to determine what's going on in the environment, what is the stimulus that he can't focus on, uh, how does his mind work, how does his senses work, and then you put all that together and decide which direction to go. I think one of the most fascinating things that has helped our family and helped me personally is that when... When Jen was diagnosed with autism, the, one of the first people that to talked to me about it, and I said, I just don't understand what it is. Mm -hmm. I know it's a neurological difference, but what is it? What's, what, right, what's happening? Right, right, right. And they said one of the theories is about them not being able to inhibit, that they're, all of the inputs are coming in all at the right. same time. And right, right. Imagine if you were standing there and 32 people were talking to you at the same time. Exactly. You shut down. Totally. And I went, oh, okay, I suffer from this. Oh, yeah. I have a trouble editing and they said oh good well then you'll figure it out for yourself and then you'll I'm still figuring it out for myself absolutely but skills has a whole section on inhibition now yes. I thought that was about you know people taking their clothes off it's not it's no no inhibiting your responses to things mm -hmm. it's why I'm late because instead of inhibiting my response to the phone ringing when I'm supposed to be out the door I go over and pick it up and sure sure I'm not inhibiting that right and so I don't get to my goal totally and when and that opened up my mind to look at so many things and so different and when, so when we talk about autism sometimes being a gift and people yes. go how can it be a gift right because when we take the time to look at something we learn more about ourselves when we say it a gift in some respects that's what I mean mm -hmm. I've learned so much about the way my brain works and how different that is than the way your brain works mm -hmm. and how different that is from the way everyone else's brain works right and if and I do think that the lessons about inhibition in skills are are great for all of us and as a parent and as a caregiver to kind of look at and think about put it through your own meter it's going to be different than your child's meter but to begin to understand oh yeah. If I I know if I go someplace and there's 32 things happening at once afterwards I am exhausted. Totally. Totally right. And I can't 
process. That's right. And so, you know, and you're able to not only describe that, but you're aware of it, right? I mean, so you notice that in yourself. So with our kids, they grow up this way. They don't know any different, right. and they don't know that, oh, it's not meant to be this way. So a lot, they can't describe it because they don't know how to even describe something because it's their state of being. Right. So, and they just physiologically react to it, you know, like, okay, I'm going to shut everything out because it's just overwhelming. And then for us to try to go in and say, hey, shut this part out, but leave that part, you know, like yeah. focus on language, focus on the instrument, but leave all the outside noise away. It's, it's a very hard thing. Yes. And, and uh, that's why I think behaviorally, you don't go in cognitively and tell, you, you don't go and say, okay, shut that out, shut that out, shut up and focus out. You actually just reinforce the focus on the right stimulus. Absolutely. It's called saliency. And you will reinforce continuously. And that's what is important for this family. It's like, is it actually that he has a hard time with just words? If it is, then focus on that. Right. Or is it that he has a hard time with everything? In which right. case, we need to focus on some mind activities that help him focus. But for instance, I think about um, in Christina Adams' book, A Real mm -hmm. Boy, there's mm -hmm. a, they always played music during mm -hmm. dinner and they would get meltdowns, and there's one point when a friend comes over and is sitting there, and, and I think there's something else noise in the background, like there's a TV in the background, and there's music playing, mm -hmm. and they're trying to get him to eat, and the friend goes, I would lose my mind. Yes, like, yes. Like, why don't you turn stuff off? Right. Like, what you want him to do is to eat. Why don't you turn the other things stuff off? Things off. And sometimes we've gotten used to it. We don't realize. We just don't. Um, all the different things that are going on right. them that somebody's having to combat to do the one skill you're trying to get it's, them to do. Absolutely. And it's really funny. The other side of this, my husband, he's, I'm one of those people that like cannot sleep if there's noise in the yeah. room. Like I have to have everything turned off. Honestly, otherwise I will just focus on the noise. Yeah. But he's the exact opposite. Yeah, he likes TV on. Yeah. He likes to fall asleep to background noise. Yeah. And he said, and I tell him, I'm like, how do you focus on, how do you do this? And he's like, I just can't be left alone with the thoughts in my head. <laughs> I, I need to it. have something that distracts <laughs> yeah. me. And, and so it's interesting, though, when he says that, because I think that's part of also what goes on with our kids is they just, they're, they're, it's a mishmash of like external and internal, and it's all just too much for them. And so, you know, that's, they can't describe it. Yeah. But it is interfering with the thoughts in their head as well. And we just don't know how much of it there is. I only learned all this from our recovered kids, you know, who come to me and say, oh, the sound of, I will never forget Andy. One of my kids, Andy, told me, it's just that like certain sounds, like the door opening and closing was the most hilarious sound. For some reason, every time I heard a door open and close, I'd crack up and start <laughs> laughing. But language was like a really hard sound for me to hear. It was just in the background, and I had to really focus on it. It's wow. very interesting. It's so interesting. It's one of the reasons why our Recovered Kids is such a great resource. Oh, they're just uh, amazing. It's a wonderful thing. All right, I want to ask uh, a quick question here. Mm -hmm. Is there a program in Fort Myers, Florida for a 19-year-old boy uh, with Asperger's to get help with a job and self-help? Honestly, I don't know the area well enough to be able to advise on that. Um, who would know at card about Florida and the Fort Myers area? Um, the only person I can think of is our expansion department, John Galley's group. Um, yeah, maybe we can ask around and try to see what programs are out there. There's a, um, there's a, uh, I guess, a, an online program called Love My Provider. And they tend that their job is to have providers listed on their website. So look up Love My Provider, because what they have is providers of different th services for individuals with autism all over the country. So hopefully they've hit Florida and they have a lot of connections in Florida. I'm pretty sure they're all over the country now. So it would be good to look at Love My Provider too and see what they suggest. You know what we always say here at Autism Live, if you see a need, fill it. So if it's not there, you might have to create it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that could be a journey for you. Absolutely. Uh, an interesting journey. Totally. Not an easy one, but a worthwhile one. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll look into it, and you look into it, and let's, let's reconvene. <laughs> we'll meet with you next week. All right, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to be back with more Ask Dr. Doreen after these messages. Stick with us. 
Our twins, Justin and Jessica, were premature babies, so we always were very conscientious of their development, but I think it was probably 15 months, Justin started getting really obsessive compulsive with opening and closing doors. And Justin started tantruming a lot, too. These would be major tantrums that were just completely debilitating to the family. Having to take them out of the house, put them in the car, drive around, just to calm them down. Yeah, I remember a breaking point and just thinking, you know what, we gotta do something, this is not right. Once we were on the track to getting a diagnosis for autism, we started sharing that with our close friends and family. It just so happens that somebody from our older daughter's private school called us out of the blue. She introduced herself and she says, I know that recovery is possible. Those words so early in our journey were a guiding force for us. As we got more educated in knowing what is effective therapies for kids with autism, we realized quality ABA is vital to that progress. That's where we decided that CARD was the right provider for us and for our son. Justin responded very well to therapy. The behaviors were tracked and we saw that what was being instituted was working. Justin, what are you doing? I'm coloring. You are coloring, good for you. There was real progress and there was progress that was tangible. I just remember when he he made a sentence, he said a sentence. We were just happy about it, going, no way, I can't believe you just did that. What's the date? The 18th. 18th of what month? December. Oh, what year is it? 2007. Oh, okay, so how old are you today then? The therapies that CAR did for Justin didn't just impact his daily living skills, but it was a positive impact on our entire family. Justin, I am in fourth grade. I like playing video games sometimes. My dream to build a teleporter machine. Like sometimes if like we're on an airplane and it's like really long, you guys just say, oh, hurry up with that teleporter machine. I'm waiting on you. <laughs> and I just started Friday Night Lights. This is our third game of the season and um, it's pretty fun. You have to be fast. We attribute so much of Justin's recovery to CARD. Their goal was the same as our goal. We wanted Justin recovered. June 12, 2008 is a day that I celebrate every year because that is the day that Justin was deemed recovered from autism. And Dr. Doreen Grampiche met with us, looked at him and just said, he's brilliant. You need to keep his mind stimulated because he's very smart and he has no residual traits of autism. Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. We're here with Dr. Doreen Grampiche and she's answering your questions in real time. Our next question, hello Shannon and Dr. Doreen with an exclamation point. My five-year-old son attends a progressive kindergarten class. It is not exactly a special education program, but he has a shadow teacher knowledgeable in ABA. We're having a hard time finding school appropriate reinforcers for him that will not distract the other kids in, in school. Visual and auditory items are the strongest reinforcers for him, but they can be quite distracting in school. Even glitter bottles, for example, can be distracting because naturally the kids are drawn to these novel items. Any suggestions on reinforcers appropriate in a school setting and how they can be delivered discreetly? Thank you and all the best to you and CARD. Your show has been such a blessing.
sharing so much valuable information to the public reaching across the globe. And can I just say, she says, I love skills. Any chance you can open oh. services in the <coughs> Wow, that's so nice. That I, it is lovely. I, uh, thank you very much for writing in. And I, I love that you're in the Philippines. I didn't know that. Um, <coughs> we would love to open services anywhere. What we do internationally, I've stopped focusing on actually opening card sites. What, I do, what we do in international places is we will uh, affiliate with an existing school or clinic and then we will tr train them and supervise them. Um, that's what we did with South Africa and we still are very involved with them. We have literally supervisors going to South Africa every other month and we have for six years I think six or seven years so it's a long time and South Africa has three sites and we heavily <coughs> it's a complete card program um, same thing we did in Thailand and we'd be happy to do it in Philippines now so if you know of any good schools please let us know that are interested in doing the card model um, going back to this <coughs> I don't know the functioning level of the child my recommendation would be to try to implement a token system in the class if possible and that has to do with if your child if the child is able to jump on board with a token economy a token economy could work for the whole class not just for him um, and basically just let me describe what it is for him and then I'll describe how it would work for if the teacher decided to use it for everyone so there would be a series of things that are required for him to do for by which he would get a reinforcer you what you're doing is you're giving the direct reinforcer, let's say, glitter bottles. I don't know the length of time you give it to him, and I don't know for what. But assume there's a behavior that's expected, and then he gets X amount of time with the glitter bottle. What you're doing with the token economy is you are just giving the reinforcer, being the, token, being the glitter bottle, after the person earns a certain number of tokens. So... It could be a one-to-one -one exchange. In other words, he would get one token, and then he'd be allowed to go outside for five seconds, five minutes, play with the glitter bottle, or just leaving the room might be a reinforcer. Or uh, the teacher might want to put an area in the classroom, which is the reinforcement area. This is extremely effective, like <clears throat> for all students. What you could do is you could have an area which is packed with reinforcers for all the kids, and you as a child can access that area for however long it's not is conducive to her teaching her class for specific behaviors. Um, so that's really all it is. She would put up a board, she would have all the names of the kids, and she would have the tasks that they're required to do and what they earn for each task. And once they've earned, let's say, the tokens, by the way, would be stickers, could be drawings like we used to do just happy faces you know every time you finish a task you get a happy face if you get five happy faces you then go to the reinforcement area like the fun house or whatever it is and that could be applied to everyone so that everyone's really motivated to pay attention do their work and then gain access to those reinforcers and Jem's, most of his early classes, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, even third grade, there was some form of a treasure box that we treasure box. go to the treasure box, That's and there was a choice of toys that came from a dollar store exactly. that they could choose between, and it was such a big deal to get Huge. to the tre treasure box That's right. that people tried to gain those tokens. That's right. Um, and we also, just so you know, we've done several videos here on Autism Live about token economies, and we even have a template for one. Um, and show you how to laminate and make the Great. little stickers and put the little Velcro on for one type of a token economy. And we talk about the ones that are digital. Cause there's Absol oh, yes. So if you search our topics about token economies, you'll see that there's a bunch of different things that we have there. And if you don't find what you like there, Pinterest, there are all kinds oh, of yeah. things on Pinterest. If you put in token economy um, and if you put in classroom, they have teacher sites where teachers... Teachers actually make this kind of stuff now, the ones that are good at it, yes. and then they sell it at low cost to other people. Amazing. So you're, and it's called Teachers Paying Teachers. That's great. Um, and so you can pay $5 and they'll send you off whatever token account it's. So check it out on Pinterest. That's awesome. You can lose That's your really mind great. on Pinterest in the best possible way. Absolutely. I love, I love me some Pinterest. Okay, I want to shift now to a question that just came in on the live feature mm -hmm. from our West Virginia mom. 
Um, she says, hey, Shannon and Dr. Doreen, her daughter had strep throat for a total of 20 days, started having increased anxiety, OCD, hyperactivity, paranoia, tics, and a long list of other behaviors that followed the strep infection. After seeing her neurologist, she received a diagnosis Pandas. of PANDAS. Yes. Yeah. The tics are painful. She is paranoid. Regression in potty training, regression in speech, and the meltdowns have increased significantly. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations on dealing with PANDAS, and how do I determine what is autistic behavior that needs to be addressed and, and what is a side effect from PANDAS that she can't control? Thank you always for the support and help. We love you guys. Thank you very much. There are, she, you should be talking to a physician who specializes in pandas, and this would be an immunologist. And an immunologist will actually offer some medications that will help suppress some of these side effects. And as you were beginning to read the list, I was like, oh, this is pandas. Uh, and that is, of course, pediatric autoimmune neurological disorder associated with strep. That's how you get pandas. That's a mouthful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you knew that. <laughs> yes. So the first time I learned about pandas, I remember actually uh, it, it was in a continuing ed lecture, and I was like, that sounds like a lot of our kids. Like, I wonder how many of our kids have pandas. So I wouldn't, th please don't think of them as, if it's a symptom of pandas, it's not something she can control. You get back into, it, it's, how do I express this? It's kind of like um, if you are, let's say if you are ill for whatever reason, let's say you have a, a gastrointestinal infection or you have uh, food poisoning or whatever it is, you have some sort of illness during that period of time, so much biochemistry changes that, for instance, you will become more irritable, you will have, like, your skin will crawl, um, you'll have, you know, headaches, various things, but you can still change some of those things. So the fact that you become more ir irritable doesn't mean that you can't control your behavior. You can. It's a little harder because you're more irritable and, like, you're on edge, but you can. And so some, a lot of these things, ticks are very, very hard to control, but they are controllable. Okay. Ticks are things that the behavior, you can shape the control of ticks. There's no question, behaviorally. Um, but mainly, if it is really pandas, which obviously she's been diagnosed in, there are immune medication that you should be receiving. So you need to talk to an immunologist, first of all. And then uh, don't, I mean, it's so difficult, I know, with our kids when they, uh, lose skills they've already um, achieved, but don't worry, she will, they, you can regain those skills and they will regain faster than when you taught them the first time. While she's going through whatever the treatment is to uh, eradicate the, the pandas, do we put less demands on the child? No, not really, because okay. at this point you're past the strep, and so now you should get the medication that helps the immune system, essentially strengthens the immune system, and then you should just start reteaching. Okay. Start reteaching and just, you know, at any given time, you want to always gauge how much pressure you should put or how much demand you should put, and that's always equivalent to the amount of reinforcer. Okay. As much demand as reinforcer, then your program is good. Okay. You have too much demand, not enough reinforcer, child falls apart not enough demand, too much reinforcer, you're not moving forward. Okay. So you just have to always balance that. Okay, cool. Uh, and then let us know how things go, please. And best of luck. Yes, best of luck. Hugs to you. I know that's hard. Uh, I want to move on to the next question. I'm working with a family with two autistic children. They are 12 and 5. Can you refer me to any in-home ABA therapists that serve Carver, Massachusetts? I should have looked on the map to see how close that was to Boston. I don't know. I don't know either, but I would suggest that you try to get in touch with our, our Woburn office. Yes. And they can give you more information about what's available back there. Okay, cool. Um, and then somebody who wrote, writes in and says, I need help with getting my child in a school for autism. We have no other information about their age or where they are. Right. If you would perhaps write in to us, we, are, we do have CART Academies. We are expanding the CART Academies. And then outside of CART, of course, there's many schools that are pretty good. And we can, again, another good source for that would be Love My Provider. That, uh, that website is very good in terms of, they, it definitely has a category of listed schools. Okay, wonderful. 
And this is probably going to be our last question. Good morning. My son has high-functioning autism. Mm -hmm. He's five. I've noticed an increase in hyperactive behavior when his dad comes home from work. Mm -hmm. What can we change or do differently? Is he just too excited? Also, he likes to pretend fight with his friends. It's never gotten out of control. Would, en would enrolling him in a martial arts class be a good idea or a terrible idea? And thank you for your amazing help. That's a great idea. As, uh, enrolling him in martial arts is a great idea as long as you have a good instructor. Uh, because martial arts teaches, uh, the opposite of what most people think, martial arts, arts teach you control, self-control. Yeah. And so I think it's a great idea because they will teach him to control his uh, whatever rough housing or any kind of thing that he learns in martial arts two specific times and areas so I think that's a very 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 good out for him now what happens and you see this in all a lot of different species not just human beings but like I I'm assuming that he has had uh, physical fun with dad so like maybe in the past dad has thrown him up and down or whatever and so now he gets like just it's classical conditioning it's like oh here's the guy who's going to do some physical stuff with me so he gets hyper uh, the easiest thing is to reverse that is just to have dad do a very peaceful activity when he comes home so uh, immediately when dad comes home like he will turn on some calming music sit with him and maybe look at a book or sit down and look at TV together or you know sit on a um, hammock or something that's very calming and soothing and then before you know it dad will be associated with more of a calming type thing yeah. Our, our dads tend to be the, the you know, hyper causing. I, I always say that it's, especially when I'm at the check stand with my husband and my son, even now, the gem is so big <laughs> and he's 13, it's like two puppies that have gone awry and then I have to police the two of them <laughs> and I'm trying to That's do the hilarious. transaction. And, I, and now I've, they've got, just gotten to the point where I pretend I don't know them. Yeah. I just pretend that I've never seen them before, <laughs> that I have no idea who they are. Awesome. I walk out of the store and they're like, where'd you go? Where'd you go? And I go, I don't know you. <laughs> I have no idea. I just completely <laughs> talk That's about so the funny. That's so funny. I love that. I don't know them. Because um, I used to be like, stop it. The two of you, knock it off. Don't do anything. You know, and I'd be like, they're like, oh, you got to sign. I'm always the person who does the card and then forgets to oh, do yeah. like, oh, 17 yeah. steps. And everybody in the line at Trader Joe's is like, <laughs> lady, sometime could you finish? <laughs> Anyway, that's my that's the that's story of my life. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time, but we it was a pleasure. You. Thank you we so much. So enjoy when we have time with you. Now we don't have you for a couple of weeks coming that's up, right. um, but we are going to have you back in the middle of of July, and then you're back for most of August, I think. Yes, so, I am. Um, so not uh, you've got great things to do and important things that you need to do. We we will soldier on without you. Thank you. Um, Have a thank wonderful you for summer. All the time. Yes, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Uh, and for those of you who are watching, don't go away because we've got one more hour. It's time for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. It'll be just me. Uh, but not just me. We've got two great guests. Vince Redmond, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist, is going to be with us a little bit later on in the hour. And before that, we have Paul Fijel, who is the head of production for Awake Labs, a product called Reveal. And you're going to love hearing about this. And we've got some great in the news coming up as well. So stick with us. First, it is time for the A word. And then it will be time for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Here is the A word.
point of ABA is that you teach him how, how to teach himself. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that that is necessarily, I, I guess I didn't realize that that was supposed to happen from the beginning. I thought that now it was all a lot of work with him and then later he would start to figure out how to do it for himself. But he's already doing it. And, and you know, repetition is, is the underlying thing because, or I think young kids in, in general, but certainly with kids with autism, it takes them a little, I think it takes them a little more time. think we completely appreciate how much work he's doing to learn because it's normal for us too. I mean this is this is what he has to do to learn these things so it's now become normal for us. It's still hard to sit out here and listen to the monitor and and hear them repeatedly ask him to do something where he's upset and he's crying but but it always it always works out it always it's a reminder of just don't give up because he always it, eventually accomplishes what they're asking and uh, and then I hear the reward I hear him jumping up and down and them cheering <laughs> you have the monitor so you know what's happening does that make a huge difference for you I, I like to know it's um, it was hard at first to hear him um, you know it's, have a problem yeah it's easy when he's doing great to have the monitor it's hard when he's struggling and crying in, and in the beginning it was hard too because well I always thought in the beginning well, I'll Should I go help? That's how we did it. Yeah. We had speech therapy and, and occupational therapy to start with, and if he cried, then we made it better, and we were encouraged to make it better. If he was crying, speech therapist, something wasn't right. It, it was different when ABA started. It crying was sort of part of the game. <laughs> yeah, I, had a, I met a guy who uh, at a, a, not an ABA thing, what is it? Orientation. Orientation that, that basically told me ABA, yeah, they're paid to piss your kid off. <laughs> so I tried to remember that. They paid to piss him off. Yeah, he right. one day, like, he was really pissed off, and that was the scoop of soup. And then, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? that, was, that was actually a rough day for us, because we, we felt like we'd abused him almost every week. Really? I mean, Remember? I, well, yeah, I, I got what she was trying to do with him. I understood that, you know, he wasn't being compliant, but then once we realized what it was that he wanted, it yeah. was just like, He just wanted a moment to go sit in a corner, and like, you know, us adults, we would say, see ya. <laughs> but no. Well, and, and I took he him couldn't. back, and when I was changing him, the whole conversation he and I had was, "All you have to do is tell us." And, and I had him repeat, you know, four or five times. Yeah, that <laughs> was that was a bad day though for us because uh, we felt like we had let him down. But uh, well, and, don't you think? Yeah, and he how, how? And I've thought about it probably a dozen times. He must been then. miserable. He was really upset. And, uh, but you know, would it have been the right thing for us to rescue him and be like, you know what? Can we just let him go? And I don't know what the right answer is. I. I it well, we didn't think of it, and they didn't think of it. We didn't. No, we didn't know. We didn't know what he was trying to do. And, uh, we didn't know if he was just being ornery or if. <laughs> but but, it's it's a thought now. Every I mean that's that's as hard as he'd fought anything for a long time. And I sat there even thinking that it's like you know what it's hard and it's somebody else's kid and mom and dad are sitting right here and he's screaming and she had to keep doing it to show him what it was that she wanted him to do. Yeah. And you know that's not easy and I respect yeah. that. Yeah, she had a hard time. I'm sure. Just. I mean, it's got to enter their mind that mom and dad are right here, and I'm, <laughs> I'm pushing him so hard that he's, you know, he's, he's, I almost heard a couple four-letter words from a kid who doesn't talk, really. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, that was good for us to see, yeah. too, that it's like, because we, we don't know how far to push but, him when he's, when he's behaving But we way. also have to remember that we're the parents, and that, that, well, maybe there's something else going on. That, that's a lesson there for us, is that uh, maybe we should have, well, you know, next time. He's even acted differently since then. I never thought I'd like have this conversation, but you know, you just, Jack, can you just say poop? I'm pooping? Can you say that? And it's, uh, you know, that would never happen again if he, he gets that skill. That would never happen again. Like, Daddy had a poop, or Daddy poop, or whatever. Uh, mommy poop. Kids, 
He's getting there. Kids do. He's learning. Yes, he is. He's learning that he gets, he gets not necessarily everything he wants. He gets, uh, he gains from his vocabulary. He gains on specifics. We're good. Yeah, we'll go <laughs> We're good. We're good. It's all good. No. Um, I'm just physically tired. That's other than that. Um, people, strangers that used to come into our house and are, are, are now friends. You know, it's not the same thing. Um, and I think it's, it's become our normal. I don't, um, I don't think we would be, well, we'd be sad for obvious reasons. We'd be okay with it. <laughs> but having said that, we love everybody that comes in. And it, it just is what it is. And uh, we see such progress in him that I don't think uh, the inclination to be free is strong enough um, to override the inclination to continue to watch his progress. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, if we're being completely honest, and this is the hard part of the honest part, so uh -oh. uh, they, they help us. Nick was diagnosed with autism in 1994 at the age of four. He received five years of therapy from CARD that eventually faded out. Nick recovered from autism in 2001. This song I'm about to perform is by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. CARD helped many patients, myself, to recover to this level now. Cheryl and Mike's son, Jack Riley, was diagnosed with autism in 2010 at age two. He's been receiving therapy from CARD for a year and a half. Today, Cheryl, Mike, and Nick meet for the first time. I'm curious as to what you remember. I certainly remember pretty long sessions, and I'd be frustrated if I would make mistakes. I mean, I remember one time I had to count a row of six blocks, kept messing up. That was really difficult. No. I need it. I need it. At what point do you recall hearing the word autism? I was able to figure out what I was going through without anybody having to tell me. Our concern is if it's a big secret to hide. I don't know what, what we can say. No one say. ever told you, you just, you just yeah. discerned But the it. reason I'm comfortable talking about this is because I felt it. In therapy, I began, I certainly began questioning why you know, people reacted as they did based on what I said and did. Particularly because of difficulties I was facing in school, I just, it got to a point where I wanted to understand why it was. So I entered while still um, going through therapy and still showing significant signs of mental condition. Even after I'd improved to a significant extent, there were those who still gave me a hard time for it. Did it hurt your feelings when you were in school, the way it that did. kids... Oh, absolutely, because it was bullying, it was harassment. That scares us. That, they called me names. They, I was basically, when it came to sports and PE, I was usually the last kid chosen. Did yeah. teachers intervene? Um, fortunately, not really. I mean, it was just so hard for me to talk about it because of how ashamed I felt. You know, certainly the first few years of elementary school, I don't think I really had the most supportive teachers. I mean, I remember, I, my mom told me how my first grade teacher once said that she thought I had no chance of getting anywhere and going away to college and out of state and being the only person um, for my old school district has made a difference. It's just really improved my you social life tremendously you, because that? I got to be me because with nobody knowing about my past, I wasn't faced with these um, misconceptions and prejudgments. Do you tell people, new people that you meet? At no, that's not the first thing I will ever No, I would I hope tell it's not the first and thing. And you know what? In, in most cases, I never do because while it's a part of my past, it doesn't define who I am. I mean. Just thinking back, just thinking back to the very beginning, pretty much each episode, autism, what, not who. I want to tell you right now, though, uh, I'm so impressed with you. Likewise. I want you to know that. Likewise.
I mean, um, your your son really inspires me just good, as much good, because good, good. I'll tell you anytime I, I, I adore him, and, yeah. and and but I'd be lying if I I, I said it wasn't challenging. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's 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 cost me my 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 the stuff that uh, you know like career things mm -hmm. goals. I don't care about those anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I work at night. I'm tending bar. Mm -hmm. Um, not that I'm too good for that. I'm just saying that's what I do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I want him to have a chance. Right. And uh, you, you inspire me now. Thank you. The feeling goes both ways. The feeling's mutual. Before you leave today, we'd yeah. like you to meet Jack. I would love to. This is Nick. Hi, Nick. Hey, Jack Riley. All right, should we try this? Can I take a picture of all you? One, two, and three. Back to Autism Live and to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. As I mentioned earlier, Miss Nancy is not with us today. She's going to be joining us in a few weeks. Um, but I, I'm, I'm keeping the train going here. We've got a great show for you here this morning. Uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to have our special guest who's going to be with us, Paul Fijal. hope I'm saying his name right. Uh, he is the head of product development at Awake Labs, and they have a new product that's called the Reveal. It's a wristband that can tell what the physiological changes are in an individual and monitor their anxiety in a real time so that parents and caregivers can begin to predict when meltdowns are about to happen. So if we can predict them, we can head them off at the past. So that's a really cool thing. Uh, so he's going to be with us, and then a little later in the program, uh, Skype willing, because <laughs> we've been having sound issues, uh, we will have with us Vince Redman, who's a licensed marriage and family therapist, and he's going to be talking with us about the role that a licensed marriage and family therapist can play in a family's journey through autism. I think that's a pretty special thing to do. But first, it is time for In the News. We've got some pretty exciting news. Our first story comes to us from Science Daily. Uh, it is about a new study that is coming from the University of Southern California. It's uh, about brain mapping, and it says a new brain map could enable novel, novel therapies for autism and Huntington's disease. The USC scientists have mapped an uncharted portion of the mouse brain. So this isn't a mouse, but it, it's beginning to explain which circuit disruptions might occur in disorders such as Huntington's disease and autism. The scientists injected fluorescent molecules into 150 mice and then they watched the cell pathways to see where they went. Um, this is considered absolutely revolutionary. The, uh, one of the lead uh, researchers, Hong Li Dong, who is an associate professor of neurology at the USC Mark and Mary Stevens Neuroimaging and Informatics Institute said, and I quote, this study moves researchers to the next level to help them understand how the brain circuit is disrupted. Previously, the dorsal striatum was one huge thing. It's almost like telling someone that they should come visit you in California. Where should they go? Uh, we've really narrowed it down to, I live in North Hollywood in this apartment building. That will help people in the future to really understand the pathways for diseases with specific symptoms. And again, they're already looking at this and seeing that this could play a huge role in helping individuals with Huntington's disease and with autism. We're going to look forward to hearing more about that and want to congratulate everybody at the University of Southern California for this information. Uh, moving on, we're going to be talking a lot in the coming weeks about a couple of different hormones and what might provoke them. Uh, so there is uh, a study in the New York Daily News today talking about the chatty gene. Is there a chatty gene that gives us the gift of gab and could it, in fact, uh, be something that if we enhance that gene in individuals with autism that they would have more ability to deal with uh, language and social language? Uh, <clears throat> what is it that we're talking about? It's gene OXT that gives folks the gift of gab. Clearly, I have this in force, right? I have the gift of gab. Uh, this chatty gene is responsible for producing oxytocin. 
we're going to be talking about oxytocin a lot today and every day. This is oxytocin is known as the cuddle hormone or the subtle, uh, excuse me, the social hormone. It's the one that makes people want to be more outgoing. Um, it's in a really important part of human bonding. We've seen studies that show that if someone is low in oxytocin, then they're not going to want to be social. And if oxytocin is, uh, is, is given to that individual, that it makes them want to be more social. Uh, so researchers are looking at how this plays a role and is there a way that we can goose that level of oxytocin? And on the flip side, is there potentially a way that they could make people like me less chatty? Uh, you know, I'm just saying, I'm guilty as charged. And so that leads us to, my friends, the story of the day. Uh, we are talking today about gut issues and does gut bacteria have something to do with autism? Well, a lot of people think that it does, and in fact, now today there is more evidence than ever that it does play a role. There's a new study that comes to us from the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and it was published in Cell Magazine just last week. The study seems to show a clear relationship between gut flora, obesity, and social behavior, at least in mice. Recent studies have suggested that obesity in general in a mother could make their offspring more likely to have autism spectrum disorder. That's in humans, but we're seeing that it is the same in, in mice, that if the mother is obese, that the mice will be more likely to want to have less to do with the other mice in terms of social situations. Uh, so the, the Baylor study then looked at what, that, what might be causing that, and they discovered that there is something called L. ruteri. It is a probiotic that is in people's guts, in people's guts, in fact, and also in mice guts, that causes someone to create what? More oxytocin. So if you have somebody who is obese, they are creating less L. ruteri in their gut system. Um, and that means that their child will have less ruteri as well. So could that be a contributing factor towards autism? Well, when they looked in the mice model and they gave the mothers the L. ruteri, they did not, even though they were obese, they did not have mice that were antisocial. When they gave it to mice, the L. ruteri, that were antisocial, if they gave it to them early enough, they saw that that mouse then regained its ability to engage in social activity. Do we see this working in a human model? At this point, nobody knows. Um, but we know that probiotics are a great thing for us to take. And if you look and see if your probiotic has L. ruteri in it, there is no harm that can come from having that in your probiotic. No harm whatsoever as long as you take it following the directions of your doctor and the directions of the label. So something that we all could be looking at, I will tell you that there are plenty of other studies about L. ruteri with individuals from the autism spectrum, and one of the things that we do know that it does is that it reduces pain in children who are having gastrointestinal issues. So uh, if you've got kiddos that are um, having that already, check your probiotic label, see if it has L. ruteri in it, and if it doesn't, you might want to consider getting one that does. And that's our story of the day. Uh, moving on, we've, we've got a great guest who's coming up for us in just a few minutes, Paul Fajal. He's going to be with us talking um, from Awake Labs, talking about something called the Reveal. I keep putting my hand around my wrist because it is a bracelet. Um, so we're looking forward to talking to Paul. We're going to take a short break and hopefully have him on the line. Keep your fingers crossed for Skype. All right. <laughs> we'll be back after these messages.
you want to try calling him on the phone? Uh, okay. I'll tell him you're going to call him on the phone. Our twins, Justin and Jessica, were premature babies, so we always were very conscientious of their development, but I think it was probably 15 months, Justin started getting really obsessive compulsive with opening and closing doors, and Justin started tantruming a lot too. These would be major tantrums that were just completely debilitating to the family. Having to take them out of the house, put them in the car, drive around, just to calm them down. Yeah, I remember a breaking point and just thinking, you know what, we gotta do something, this is not right. Once we were on the track to getting a diagnosis for autism, we started sharing that with our close friends and family. It just so happens that somebody from our older daughter's private school called us out of the blue. She introduced herself and she says, I know that recovery is possible. Those words so early in our journey were a guiding force for us. As we got more educated in knowing what is effective therapies for kids with autism, we realized quality ABA is vital to that progress. That's where we decided that CARD was the right provider for us and for our son. Justin responded very well to therapy. The behaviors were tracked and we saw that what was being instituted was working. Justin, what are you doing? I'm coloring. You are coloring, good for you. There was real progress and there was progress that was tangible. I just remember when he he made a sentence, he said a sentence. We were just happy about it, going, no way, I can't believe you just did that. What's the date? The 18th. 18th of what month? December. Oh, what year is it? 2007. Oh, okay, so how old are you today then? Got about a minute and a half. The therapies that Carr did for Justin didn't just impact his daily living skills, but it was a positive impact on our entire family. Justin, I am in fourth grade. I like playing video games sometimes. My dream to build a teleporter machine. Like sometimes if like we're on an airplane and it's like mm -hmm. really long, 
you guys just say, oh, hurry up with that teleporter machine. I'm waiting on you. You got one minute? <laughs> and I just started Friday Night Lights. This is our third game of the season, and um, it's pretty fun. You have to be fast. We attribute so much of Justin's recovery to CARD. Their goal was the same as our goal. We wanted Justin recover. June 12, 2008 is a day that I celebrate every year because that is the day that Justin was deemed recovered from autism. And Dr. Doreen Grampiche met with us, looked at him and just said, he's brilliant. You need to keep his mind stimulated because he's very smart and he has no residual traits of autism. that has a new product that's coming out that's called Reveal. And as we were saying earlier in the show, it is an innovative um, tool that I think is amazing for autism parents. So first of all, we have to thank Paul for being a sport and being willing to be with us on the phone um, as our Skype is not currently being cooperative. Um, and we're going to schedule a time to have Paul come back when we can see him as well. But Paul, thank you so much for, for being flexible and for being with us. Um, and thank you for being... Thank you for working on this amazing product. I was explaining to the, the folks at home that this is a wristband, correct? Yes, so, yeah, it's, it's a wearable band. Uh, we've been talking to families, and at first we thought maybe you could potentially go around the ankle, but a lot of feedback that we've been getting is saying a wrist is a preferable location for this. So that's, that's where we're designing around it now. And what is it that's so unique about what Reveal can do that autism parents are going to go gazanga over? <laughs> Good question. Uh, there's a number of different things that, that make this a pretty, a pretty cool product. On the first, um, the fact that the wearable itself is designed specifically with autism in mind. We've spoken and continue to engage with our community here uh, in Vancouver and around the area and, and to get feedback from parents and from individuals with autism to help us design the wearable so it can be usable for them. So we're addressing hypersensitivity issues, making sure it's very comfortable, that it's flexible, uh, that it's durable, you know, anything from shockproof to chewproof to waterproof. Uh, so that's just on, on the wearable side of things, but the application where all this information is being sent to is going to be interactive and uh, give the opportunity to parents and caregivers right now and down the road to autistic individuals themselves to plug in all the information about like uh, kind of additional context to what's going on. So, so uh, what I'm does it what does it do? How much does it do? It measures three physiological signals in anxiety, so heart rate, skin temperature, and electrodermal activity. All that is sent over to a parent or caregiver smartphone, and then you have the opportunity to add more information to that. So, for example, uh, the location, or what was the activity that was going on at the time, or uh, you know, what behavior was, was observed, and then all of that is crunched together, and it gives a more personalized uh, profile of anxiety that takes into account all this different type of information. And to me, this, like, this is so exciting, the idea of, so, first of all, when we're with our children, we can be out someplace, say at the grocery store with our child, and we're attending to so many different things. Like we're looking at the label of, you know, whether this is the can of corn that we want to buy or not. And we're also attending to our children. And sometimes we miss subtle clues. And we find ourselves at the check stand with a child who is completely losing it at that point. And a lot of times we as autism parents think, okay, well, it just happened at the check stand. And maybe sometimes it does, but a lot of times it starts 30 minutes before. And if we could have something that kind of poked us in the back and said, hey, by the way, your child's level of being able to cope is diminishing as we speak, we could change our behavior and do something differently. And that's kind of what you, you're putting on our smartphone for us, right? That's, that's, you, you 
nailed it. That's exactly what we're doing. Um, I'm an autism mom, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know how this can work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you pretty much nailed it. I mean, uh, that's another a huge valuable way that reveal could be used is having that that notification, that, that indicator that um, anxiety might be rising, something might be going on actually before the meltdown is about to happen. And then exactly like you said, being able to address it uh, before the situation escalates and potentially avoid um, like a, an escalated situation altogether. But then, but then on top of that, you know, sometimes we talk about all the time on the show about looking at the ABCs of behavior, that there's an antecedent, there's a behavior, and there's a consequence, and how it's really tough sometimes uh, to go back and think, okay, what happened before the behavior? What happened before they bit somebody? What happened before they had the meltdown? Um, and and we can be we can think about it and we can try to come up with ideas, but it's unless it was videotaped, we're we're, we're being it's subjective, right? Um, but but in fact, you're taking data for us, so after a meltdown happens, we can kind of go back and look and see was it was there a sharp spike in something that happened, or was there something that happened 20 minutes before that very slowly increased the level of anxiety. And 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 we can we can go back and and have that artifact, right? Exactly. Yeah. Paul, you have all that information at hand and have everything, and even having the option of sharing it with other people in your care team. I mean, it's great for you as a parent to be able to see that. But if you wanted to involve a behavior consultant or a behavior interventionist or uh, people to help you create those plans and identify those patterns, I mean, having the option to share um, that data with them would be up to you as well. Yeah, but I, I, can, I can see as an autism parent where that is like the best thing ever, to be able to share real data, because I can't tell you how many times my kid was engaged in a behavior, and my therapy team would say, okay, we need you to take some data, and I would admit, immediately think, oh, no. Because, um, you know, I want to be the best possible mom that I can be, but I have a lot of emotions going on while my child's having a tantrum. And, you know, I'm not the best court reporter in this case. And so you have this push me, pull you thing of, well, you know, I, I want to I do the best possible job I can, but you got a lot of other stuff going on. So to be able to hand over my phone and go, here, let's all take a look at the data together, it's like having a court reporter with you. It's brilliant, Paul. I'm very happy that you, uh, that you think so. I get it. I really like it. And But I'm wondering, uh, on the, some of the fine points of it, like if my child is at school and he's got his reveal on, how far away can I be from my child? Can I be in another city, in another town, and I'm still going to get data, or do I have to be close? That's a good question. So the way that the, the signals would be communicated to a phone right now is through Bluetooth, and Bluetooth has a limited range, so okay. 25 to 30 meters. And I don't know what the conversion of that is in feet, but okay. <laughs> we're Canadian up here, speed meters. Um, however, the like if the information is stored on the app, then the information that's on the app would be accessible to you. Um, whether or not you have the real time physiological changes that are happening in the moment, but you would have the opportunity to go back and to access the log information through the app. Okay, so at the end of the day, he comes home from school, and I can take a look, and I could see which class he was in or what time period or what section of the class he was taking when he was having more anxiety. Exactly. Paul, this is really good. <laughs> cool. <laughs> no, no, seriously, because so often our kids will come home, and because language is part of their deficit and we don't have eyes on at school we can talk about it endlessly and we can ask the other people at school to report to us and say well when did you feel like he was having anxiety or you know because we might have a kid who just comes home and they show us their behavior or they uh you know use their og device or they use their words to say i don't want to go to school anymore and it might just be that it's 10 minutes of the day that's wrecking the whole thing and, there, and if we could fix that 10 minutes our kid would be successful at school but who knows which 10 minutes it is. Um, so you can help us to figure out which 10 minutes it is or if they're in anxiety the entire day. Paul, this is truly, truly brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I love what you're doing. So, But the fact of the matter is, is that I can't rush out and buy it today. This is a product that's being developed, and you guys have an Indiegogo that's going right now that we can all participate in. 
Absolutely. And so, how do we do yeah, that? You're right, but first, okay. Um, so like you said, uh, their Indigo campaign is running right now, and what that means is that you can actually pre-order reveals. So what that means is you pay now, and there's discount, like at a discounted price, and there's a, a few tiers of pricing. Uh, if you check out the website, which is, which is igg.me backslash at backslash reveal cares. So all the information is up on that website. Um, and essentially what it means is that you can pre-order and you can become a part of the community of the supporters of the backers. We welcome feedback and opinions and comments from everybody whether or not you choose to back it. And then once the device is ready, which we are aiming for uh, a first version to be released in May of 2017, then you are on that list and you're one of the first people to receive that version. And then you can help us develop it further, tell us what's good, what's bad about it, and help us improve. So you really become a part of that that whole creation process. And 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 that's part and parcel of, you know, and I love that about an Indiegogo go campaign, that you're in on the ground floor, you're going to be the first people to get it, and you also get a say in the shaping of how it is. But that's also, let's be honest, why it's going to be less expensive for you, because you're buying into it now, and you're going to be a part of the process. So I absolutely love that. Again, we want to tell people to go to IGG dot m e backslash at a t backslash reveal cares r e v e a l c a r e s and that's where you're going to be able to find more information and it will link you to the indiegogo um and paul we're excited to have you back on when we can actually see the bracelet if you guys go on to the website you'll see it it looks cool um which i have to say is important because our you know no, I mean, you know, our no, kids... We, that's, that's true. We, we've gotten a lot of feedback from parents as well with, with the same comments. Yeah. And it has to look, has to look cool. It has to be something that everybody would want to wear. So. Yeah. Our kids get picked on for enough other things. When we can give them things that raise their status, bueno, muy bueno, right? When we give them things that look clunky and out of step, we're just hampering them. But you guys have been very mindful about giving them something that looks... Super cool, super sleek, super technology, high tech, um, and everybody responds to that. Let's face it. So we, you know, definitely check out the pictures of it, and we promise that we will have you back on, Paul, so that we can we can see you wearing it and and so on and so forth. But we want to thank everybody who's working on this. I think it is a super duper idea. I love the interface with people's smartphones. I even, as a former teacher, am wondering if at some point a, a, a parent can transfer and also have it during certain times of the day transfer to a teacher's smartphone so that the teacher could be monitoring it too and know when the child, is their anxiety is starting to raise. So that's my two cents. Right, yeah, and, and good point. And we are, uh, so part of the system will, you know, you'd be able to share that information, share the app with other people within your care team. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that if that involves uh, an education assistant at school to have access to the app while they're working with your child, then that's that's something that we're uh, we're building on right now. Super duper cool, Paul. Thank you so much for what you're doing and for being with us this morning and be willing to be with us on the phone. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Give our best to everybody there. Sounds good. We'll bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Wonderful, wonderful new product, interacts w with your child, with your phone, gives you more clues into what's happening with your kiddo. Uh, super fabulous. And then we have the ability with that knowledge to change our behavior because we know that's a part of this, right? If we change our behavior, it has big effects on what happens with our kiddos, with their progress, with how much they enjoy their life, how much they enjoy the world. Who doesn't want that? Uh, so congratulations to Awake Labs. Again, that's igg.me backslash at at slash r-e-v-e-a-l-c-a-r-e-s. It spells reveal cares. All right, we're going to take a break, and then we are going to be back probably on the phone with Vince Redmond. Stick with us more. Let's talk autism with Shannon and Nancy after these messages. Now i got to find a number. What would you do if your child was hurting? If your family's future was uncertain? If help seemed out of reach? 
Have you been given no hope? Taga means I am not alone in this. This is the reality for families affected by autism. And today, the number of children with autism is growing more rapidly than ever. Taka unites these families and shows that they do not have to fight this battle alone. Our oldest son, Jared, who has autism, um, when we first um, took him to the doctor to get the diagnosis, you know, it, it's so sad because they offer you nothing. There's no help, there's no hope. One of the things that you learn with autism is being very grateful for even the small milestones. You know, when you first get the diagnosis, there's, you go through all the range of emotions. You know, this can't be happening. Why is this happening? You have to get to a point where it's the emotion that has to be leading is, what can I do? The first thing that struck me was walking to a room and seeing, oh my gosh, we're not alone. And there is this very strong community that's already set. And something I still today associate with Taka the most is hope. To me, that's what Taka means. Taka means hope. like you've got all these dreams and goals of what your son's gonna do and you get your diagnosis and you're sent home and that's it there's no plan of action there's no here's autism here's what we're gonna do to make your life better and help him it's strictly go home and try to process it and go on the internet it was devastating and you just you know you go through this three week of depression and then you snap out of it you have to and then you start making phone calls and trying to figure out what is autism and what are we gonna do and then we found Taka <laughs> and it was life-changing autism there really is no definitive answer it is trying to find the the resources that are out there that can assist you to help your child so that you know you just don't feel so helpless at those particular moments there was direction and there was hope and there was a little ray of sunshine that he's gonna be okay and we're gonna be okay <laughs> I always look back and think we would never be where we are Carson wouldn't be where he is at without Taka So 13 years ago, my son was diagnosed with autism, and that put our whole family into a tailspin. There were so many different ideas and things that were not proven. Nobody knew what, to, what guidance to give us. We had no direction. And then we found Taka. They helped give us a path to follow, help give our son a better future and make him healthy and put him back onto the, to the road of recovery. When your son's first diagnosed, the first thing you hope for is, gosh, I just want my son to speak. I just want to be able to communicate with him in some way. Then you want a little more. You want him to go to a regular school. Then you want him to potentially have a real life and go to college. So you're always hoping for f the future of your child. My son is a happy, healthy, vibrant young boy that's going to turn 15 really soon. And we couldn't be more pleased than without Taka. I don't think we'd be in the place that we are today. We believe the future is not defined for many affected by autism. There is hope and direction for these kids and their families. TACA is dedicated to providing community, support, education, and hope to families affected by autism. At TACA? At TACA. At Taka, we are families with autism helping. Helping. Helping, helping families. families. Helping families with autism. Hi, my name is Matt. I am 19 years old and I was diagnosed with autism when I was six years old. Autism is one of the fastest growing developmental disabilities in the United States, but I am living proof that with the right treatment, hope is possible. My future is not limited. Today, I am attending Fullerton Community College and I run for the cross country team for fun with my friends. It makes me feel proud when I think about my progress. Chances are you know someone affected by autism. Show them they are not alone and help others get on the road to recovery. Contribute to talk about curing autism today.
Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. It's just Shannon today, but not just me, because I have on the phone, as I said, it would probably be on the phone, uh, Vince Redmond is with us. He is a regular, and normally you get to see Vince's shining face, but he is being flexible with us because our, our Skype uh, is not working, as you know, from watching the last interview. Um, and we're working on that, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's just not going to happen. But Vince, we didn't want to let this go. So Vince, thank you so much for being with us on the phone. How are you? I'm good. And I'm, I'm glad to be talking to you. And I, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about, because we share all the time on the show about the fact that you're a licensed marriage and family therapist. And I think that, you know, it makes a certain amount of sense to people that it is a great thing to have access to a licensed marriage and family therapist, especially when you have a kiddo who's on the autism spectrum. But this is a relatively new kind of uh, in, endeavor that uh having having you know a lot of times people go and they have behavioral therapy with their aba therapist and if they decide to go to an lmft they do that separately i think card if i'm not mistaken is one of the first places to recognize the benefit of having both from the same place and i think that my recollection of it is that you were the person who was instrumental in making that happen and i i just on behalf of a whole lot of parents i want to thank you um, for the work that you do um, and how uniquely qualified you are for this because you are a licensed marriage and family therapist, but you are also somebody who has done ABA therapy um, for years. You've been an exemplary therapist and helped to train the next generation of people coming through um, with some of the things that you've done. You're even featured in the video Recovered. So that was a mouthful, and I am going to let you talk. Um, no, but, I, I appreciate it. But we love you. And we think that you are so valuable to our families. But I wanted you to talk a little bit about why a licensed mar marriage and family therapist is a good thing for families that are dealing with autism. And and what, in particular, uh, an LMFT can do. Right. Yeah, and, and as we all know, you know, there's adding stressors to our life just continues to make things more complicated. And there's no bigger stressor than when your child, when anyone's child was dying. I've always said, and I, and I will continue to say, you know, autism is more of a family disorder than it is an individual disorder. Yeah. Because it affects everybody in the family, everyone from the nuclear family to extended family, the family of friends, right? So Amen to that. We our kids. We change. We have, to, we have to change. We have to think differently. We have to communicate differently. And oftentimes when we have to do these things, we need guidance or we help that help guide us on how to do that. Now, the behavioral help side, all, all car supervisors, and I'm sure every other agency, um, you know, for, for others that are, that are currently watching that are with other agencies, have supervisors that are able to do that on the behavioral aspect of it. how to consecrate a behavior, how to follow through with the preference assessment, how to follow through with the digital schedule, those types of things. But what about how to communicate with your spouse, how to um, best cope with all your work at household and personal stressors? How to grieve that your child has now just been diagnosed with autism. These are all different types of things that exceed the training, exceed the capacity and experience for most PCAs and supervisors that are out there doing applied behavioral therapy. So my, my conjuncture was to combine the two, right? Being able to have services within our, not only our agency, but our community, because we are, are able to service the community. It's not just hard families, any family, that are experiencing types of anxiety or physical issues or communication, couple of family issues, so that we can find the right way to alleviate these stressors, <coughs> help give them strategies on how to deal with them, help improve that part of life so that they'll have more resources, capacity, um, energy, and hope in you know, being able to, to work with their child, to be able to work with their APA program as well. Yeah, I, I think back to the early days when um, Jem was diagnosed with autism. And in the very beginning, I was so overwhelmed, but there was so much to be done that that's all I could think about. And then once we got started with CARD and I could see that we were going to make some progress, I didn't know how much progress, but it was the first inkling that I thought, okay, I need some mental help for me. 
Um, and my husband and I need ways, we don't have other examples to point to, because we didn't at the time. Um, so we didn't even have something that we could look at. There wasn't even a, a show called Parenthood where we were seeing another set of parents struggle. We were kind of on our own. And I remember saying, is there something? Is there something? Is there somebody that I can go to? And we, I went to um, just a, a therapist um, that my insurance paid for, and, and there were benefits to that. I don't want to say that there weren't benefits to it, but I will say this, Vince, that when I was talking to her about some of the things that were going on in our home and, and some of the constraints that we were doing because we were doing a 40-hour in-home ABA program, this was completely outside of her experience. And, and so I didn't, I didn't feel like she understood what I was, how I was prioritizing things. And, and one of her suggestions was, well, you need to do less of that. Um, which I was like, no, you don't get it. Like, that's not the advice that I need right now. I need somebody to tell me, you know, strategies for my personal existence. And here's this thing that, you know, we need to do for our son. It's the right thing to do. And to give me the best strategies to get it through get through it so that we don't just survive, but that we can potentially thrive. So for me, knowing that you are someone who totally gets that side of it, I just think that your support is invaluable. Um, yeah, that's actually a growth in, in, you know, and, that, and that's what we're trying to do. And, well, this is twofold. You know, trying to, you know, give more experience to MFTs that are out there. It's a growing field. It's a growing level of experience, but it also is a train, you know, different trainings and, types of continuing education that MFTs can now get, and some of it's provided by us out at you know, different conferences and so forth, but it's to get to know the autism spectrum uh, disorder, how that impacts families, how it, you know, how it impacts uh, uh, their needs, how, how to manage a family when you, know, you have a child that's on the spectrum. So the field just of marriage and family therapy is evolving as well to gain more experience with that. But that, that involves more experience, more education with the professionals. But also, again, like any any uh, specialty, you know, we have that ability really, internally with that, to have that specialty of working with families that have special uh, of child with special needs, because that's what we do. <clears throat> so the blending of the two worlds, while it's still evolving, there still is a great number of highly trained you know, marriage and family therapists or psychologists that have no training, no experience, no education in the form of how to manage a family that has special kids. So a lot of times that's out of their wheelhouse, it's out of their ballpark, and they, they don't really have uh, uh, the insight that you guys need. And, and so when we're looking for, like, you know, if you're, in a, if you're a card family, um, all you need to do is um, to ask for card services, uh, family services, and, and it, it's available to them, right? Do they have to ask right. anybody in particular? No, they can, they, can call, they can contact me directly or ask their supervisor, and then their supervisor will contact me directly. Okay. And then, you know, like, it, like any other service, we'll do, you know, verification of, of funding and coverage and then set it all up and then set, set up either with a local marriage and family therapist or if you're in an area that doesn't have a local therapist, we can also do telehealth in California right. and, in, and in Virginia, where we're able to meet via teleconference, but it's live, it's live action, it's in real time, uh, but it's also in the comforts of your own home. Love that. But so if, if somebody's not a card, uh, a member of a card family, you were mentioning that our, our services, that uh, your services that are card family services, are still available to them even if they're not a card family. So they could look right. at the locations tab and see if there is a card office near them where they could do that or they could do the telehealth. But for 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 somebody who doesn't live in those states and can't access card um, family services for various and sundry reasons, let's say that you know they're they're someplace else. What are the things that they want to ask uh, an LMFT to see if it's a good fit? Do they want to ask them if they have experience with autism? I would. I, I think, you know, especially, you know, I've been in practice, you know, as an MFT for over 13 years, and I think it's, it's very uh, understandable on a therapist's point of view for a patient or a client to come in and ask questions. 
right? Ask about training, ask about, you know, uh, philosophy, ask about, you know, experience level working with what your needs are because that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a professional who can help, you know, uh, with your needs, right? Your specific specific set of, um, you know, dynamics and values. Yeah. And to ask, asking of that and kind of, you know, doing maybe a little phone interview, what I would call, I think is absolutely appropriate. And you can let them know, you know, again, you know, the, the, the challenges you're having and you wanted to know what their experience level is working at. And this way you can help um, find a professional that you feel comfortable with and that will understand not only the stressors and anxiety that, that uh, might be going through, but also understand the dynamic of how to work um, with an ABA program as well as with their marriage and family so recommendations. Well, all of it is great advice, Vince, and you are you are such a wonderful resource for us here at Autism Live, but also for CARD and for CARD families. I hope that more families will take advantage of these services because I've seen in our lives that if you don't take care of these things now, you're going to have to take care of them later on, and everybody's happier sooner when you have people to talk to who can help you through the t sometimes just having that other perspective or to have a place where you can go and say your truths and know that you're not going to be judged is so valuable so valuable right. absolutely. And, and that's what and, you bring absolutely and, and not only to not be judged but to feel that you're going to be supported to feel that there's that this professional is going to have some insight have some advantages have some you know, tools that are going to be able to help you guys there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff going on around. Right? There's, there's your child in the service of the need, but there's a lot of other stuff. The world doesn't stop turning. Yeah. So we need to do everything we can to give them the, give those supports so that they're able to manage all of it, not just part of it. Yes. Oh yes, absolutely. Amen to that. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, but we have you back in just, I believe, two more weeks, um, Vince, back on the show. And on that show, uh, we think that you and I are going to be talking about the fact that uh, we think you and I are going on the road. <laughs> we think we're not, we're not sure. We're not sure. But we, you think, we think that you and I are going to New Orleans for the Autism Society of America conference. Uh, we haven't gotten absolute confirmation on that, but we think that's what's happening. It's written on a piece of paper. There are no plane tickets yet, but it's written on a piece of paper. So uh, if you are thinking of coming to the Autism Society of America conference in New Orleans, there's a good chance that you'll have the opportunity to meet myself and Vince. Uh, we'll be at the card booth. And uh, I believe my son will be there as, with us as well. So it could be a really good time. We're, uh, but so if uh, we're getting confirmation on that, and if that is the case, we will let you know when we have Vince back on the show in two weeks. And I'm hoping, Vince, that if we are there, that um, Nancy will be here in the studio and you and I can be doing some Skype uh, things from the booth back with the Autism Live folks. So that could, that could be very fun with maybe yeah, some special right. guests. All right, well, Vince, we thank okay. you so much for every breath you take and everything that you do. I don't think you have any idea how much you help so many families. Um, but I know, and I appreciate you, uh, we all appreciate you, and I would implore anybody who's having issues, reach out um, and see if you can be a part of uh, getting the help and support that Vince's team provides, because it's pretty spectacular. Um, so Vince, thank you, and we'll see you again in two weeks. But you and I will talk sooner to see if we're we're going to New Orleans. Exactly. Taking Sounds our good. taking our show on the road. Exactly. We're on the road. <laughs> on the road. All right. Thanks, Vince. Have a great weekend. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Um, truly, one of the people that I admire so much, um, and who's been doing things for autism families for 20 years now, I think more than 20 years. And again, you can see, if you want to see a very young Vince, um, you can watch the, the DVD Recovered, uh, which follows four individuals as they were going through their early therapy and Go one minute. them as teenagers. Um, and Vince is one of the therapists working with them when they were little, little, when he was just a young and I think before he had his babies. 
Um, and then you get to see him uh, when they were teenagers. And now, of course, you know, you get to see Vince. It's like another 10 years later. So in any case, that, there's that. Now, tomorrow, the plan for tomorrow. Uh, I, I think we're going to be here tomorrow. I think we're going to be doing a show. We've got an exciting guest, uh, a mom, Blanca Dura, who uh, has an amazing story to tell about her son first being denied his graduation with his peers and a graduation that took place for him in its place that will fill your heart and then some really exciting things having to do with summer and things that we can do this summer. So look for us tomorrow. If we're not here, it's because we're having technical issues, but I'm, I'm fingers crossed. We got here today. Uh, and we really want to thank Matt for pulling it out today and pulling it out yesterday so that today could happen. He's doing a, a wonderful job, so thank you to Matt. Uh, hopefully we see you tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.